Good morning, everybody. This hearing will come to order. I want to welcome everyone to today's legislative hearing on H.R. 2006, H.R. 2749, H.R. 2781, and a draft bill to improve the hiring, training, and efficiency of VA acquisition personnel and organizations. Before I begin, I would like to ask unanimous consent for the previous chairman of the subcommittee, Representative Kaufman, and our colleague, Representative Panetta, from California to sit in on the dais and speak at these proceedings. Without objection, so ordered. This morning, we will discuss four bills that aim to reform different aspects of acquisition in the Department of Veterans Affairs. This committee has held 27 oversight hearings on VA acquisition over the last 10 years. From constructing new buildings, to purchasing medical supplies, to procuring IT systems, to operating the CHOICE program, acquisition underpins everything VA does. The outrageous scandals of recent years are well known, and I do not think anyone in this room today doubts the need for improvement. In this conversation, we necessarily focus on medical purchasing and VHA as roughly 80% of the department's acquisition workforce either works in VHA or purchases on behalf, despite being employed by other organizations. <clears throat> it is wise to take our cues from the Choice Act Independent Assessment, the Commission on Care, and GAO. The common thread in their findings is, while a few areas of acquisition work well, notably pharmaceutical purchasing, VA contracts take too long to award, fail to produce results because they are not administered closely, and do not capture all possible savings. They attribute the problems to, conf to confusing organizational structures, overly bureaucratic procedures, inefficient IT systems, and personnel changes, excuse me, personnel challenges. I must point out that acquisition difficulties in the federal government are hardly unusual. The federal acquisition regulation is lengthy and complicated. However, all agencies operate under the FAR, and many of them do so effectively. VA's difficulties may come from the fact that, unlike some other agencies, it is responsible for all aspects of acquisition, including procurement, logistics, and construction. Each is a somewhat different situation with its own needs. As the agency tasked with serving veterans, VA also has requirements over and above those of other agencies to contract with veteran-owned small businesses and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. The current requirement, called the Rule of Two, has existed for over 10 years. And I'm sure everyone here today is well aware, last year the Supreme Court unanimously ruled in the Kingdomware decision that this requirement applies at all times and to all VA purchasing. The issue is central to our discussion today. These legislative proposals demonstrate our bipartisan commitment to making this important aspect of VA's operations work properly. I thank the bill sponsors as well as our witnesses for being with us today to present their views. To that end, I would like to briefly discuss the bill that I am proud to sponsor with Ranking Member Custer, H.R. 2749, the Protecting Business Opportunities for Veterans Act of 2017. This bill will help ensure contracts that are set aside for veteran-owned small businesses and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses actually go to companies that abide by the rules instead of opportunists who are abusing the system. Specifically, the bill strengthens existing prohibitions on improper pass-throughs, which are when a company obtains a contract, but instead of performing the required percentage of work, subcontracts the work to another company, while nonetheless collecting profit. Improper pass-throughs waste tax dollars by building in unnecessary layers of contractor profit. In VA contracts, improper pass-throughs also take away from small businesses owned by veterans and service-disabled veterans and hand it to other companies. This problem has existed, existed before the Kingdomware decision, but since the ruling, allegations of abuse have increased. H.R. 2749 requires that before any company is awarded a VA contract, 
it must certify that it will perform at least the percentage of work required by the Small Business Act and acknowledged that misrepresentations are subject to criminal fraud penalties. The bill also directs VA to refer violations or suspected violations to OIG for investigation. Finally, if the Secretary determines after consulting with OIG that a company did not follow the performance requirements and did not act in good faith, the company may be subjected to appropriate punishment. This bill strengthens enforcement of existing laws that are being ignored. It does not create any new bureaucracy and its mechanism a certification when submitting a proposal would only take a few minutes to read and fill out. It seeks to give VA a tool to make its procurement system work as intended. I now yield to Ranking Member Custer for any opening statement and remarks on today's legislation that she may have. Thank you, Chairman Bergman. <clears throat> Delighted to be here with you today and th thank you to the witnesses who are here to provide us feedback and recommendations on how we can improve these four bipartisan bills. Most of the work we do on this committee is bipartisan, and I'm proud to say that the bills before us <clears throat> today are examples of the bipartisan way in which we conduct business on the VA committee. When it comes to ensuring that taxpayer dollars are spent to get the right supplies and services so that veterans receive the health care and benefits they've earned, we're proud that we do work together to support this goal. We all support changes and reforms to make government contracting more efficient, transparent, and fair. We're also proud to support our service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses and to ensure our government is giving them business opportunities. For these reasons, I support the legislation on the agenda today, and I'm happy to be a co-sponsor of two of these measures. Chairman Bergman and I introduced H.R. 2749, the Protecting Business Opportunities for Veterans Act, to close a loophole that some service-disabled veteran-owned small business contractors were using to Pass, bypass government contracts through to non-veteran-owned businesses. This practice is unfair to the thousands of service-disabled-owned small businesses who follow the regulations and are able to do the work only to lose out on a contract. This bill would prevent these uh, SDVOSBs from subcontracting more than 50% of the contract to non-veteran-owned businesses. We want our disabled veteran entrepreneurs to thrive, and it's unfortunate that a small number of individuals were attempting to game the system for their own personal gain at the expense of disabled veteran business owners who should receive government contracting preferences. I also plan to introduce draft legislation to improve VA hiring, training, and efficiency of acquisition personnel and its organization uh, with my colleague from New England, Mr. Poliquin, and with Chairman Bergman. This legislation will require VA's procurement workforce to receive training and certification for each general schedule pay grade. It will also prioritize the use of VA acquisition internships to employ entry-level acquisition professionals at the VA. This will give our veterans who want good paying job opportunities to work at the VA as highly skilled and trained acquisition professionals. It will also require VA to examine the procurement or organization and make some changes allowing it to operate in a way that will best serve frontline employees who are providing health care and benefits to veterans. I also support H.R. 2781, ensuring veterans' enterprise participation in Strategic Sourcing Act, which would make sure more of our veteran-owned small businesses are able to compete for contracts under the Federal Strategic Sourcing Initiative, and H.R. 2006, the VA Procurement Efficiency and Transparency Act that would require the reporting of cost savings from government contract competition and the use of standardized procurement templates VA-wide. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you, Chairman Bergman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Custer. Uh, to our witnesses, we will have several members providing statements this morning. So if at some point during the hearing any of you need to briefly be excused, please uh, feel free to do so. <laughs> we will now hear from uh, Representative Kaufman speaking in support of his bill, H.R. 2006, the Procurement Efficiency and Transparency Act. Mr. Kaufman, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for including my legislation 
uh, H.R. 206, uh, the Procurement Efficiency and, and Transparency Act in today's hearing. Uh, one of uh, the VA's top procurement goals is to achieve savings through competition. But there is no uniformity in how the savings are calculated or if they are recorded at all. In fact, individual offices seem to determine these numbers according to each office's own policies. For example, when a VA procurement official says, oh, we saved uh, so many dollars through competition, there is no surefire way to judge its legitimacy. Often these numbers are based on inaccurate estimates or hypothetical cost avoidances. Uh, my legislation would mandate the use of uniform parameters for how to calculate these savings and allows the VA to write policy that fills in the specific details. Additionally, contracting officers rely on templates for key documents um, like statements of, of work and terms and conditions for their everyday duties. Currently, the VA has templates, but they are disorganized and not well maintained. To address this issue, my legislation directs the VA to organize uh, these templates and put them in a central place that is accessible to all VA's procurement offices. Mr. Chairman, the VA has acknowledged the importance of doing this, uh, but they continue to struggle to get this done. My bill gives the VA a much needed push in the right direction, and I encourage my colleagues to support this common sense measure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the, the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. We will now hear from Representative Dunn, who will be speaking in support of his bill, H.R. 2781, the Ensuring Veteran Enterprise Participation in Strategic Sourcing Act. Thank Dr. you very Dunn, much, you Mr. Chairman. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> H.R. 2781, the Ensuring Veteran Enterprise Participation in Strategic Sourcing Act, is a common sense legislation which I'm honored to sponsor with my friend and fellow member, Mr. Panetta from California. Uh, this bill closes a loophole which inadvertently denies veteran-owned small businesses and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses contracting opportunities. <clears throat> 2781 concerns a group of contracts run by the General Services Administration known as the Federal Strategic Sourcing Initiative, FSSI, which enables federal agencies to pool their money for buying power of common items like office supplies, janitorial products, building maintenance services. Each group of contracts under FSSI is awarded roughly 10 to 20 companies. When an agency needs to order such products, the agency asks for price quotes from the FSSI companies, which have already been selected and vetted and picks one of those. The FSSI is a good and simple method of purchasing. The only problem is with some of the contracts and the subcategories. These subcategories are divided in such a manner which may only have a few, and in some cases none, no veteran or service disabled veteran owned businesses. The VA is required to look for veteran and service disabled veteran owned small businesses, but in too many cases in the FSSI contracts, none of them are there to be found or too few to establish meaningful competition. H.R. 2781 directs the VA to implement the most logical fix to, to examine whether there are enough veteran-owned small businesses and service-disabled veteran small businesses for the FSSI contracts. If there are not enough veteran contractors, the bill directs the VA to work with GSA to add more. In no way does the bill force other agencies to operate differently. Instead, it helps the federal government meet the veteran-owned small business and service-disabled veteran-owned small business contracting goals by giving agencies access to a larger pool of contractors. Some may ask why this legislation is necessary. The loophole is obvious, at least to the veterans in these industries who have been frustrated at being excluded from the business opportunities under FSSI. This subcommittee brought this issue to the, sub, to the department's attention last year, and it has not been resolved. This is why Mr. Panetta and I bring this legislation forward today. I encourage all the members of the committee to support the bill, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. 
Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Next, we will hear from Representative Panetta for his comments on H.R. 2781. Mr. Panetta, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity. It's wonderful to see you in that position, especially as a freshman class member. It's great. Thank you, and thank you to all the other uh, members of this committee, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm proud to join uh, my good friend and colleague, Representative Dunn, in sponsoring H.R. 2781. The Ensuring Veteran Enterprise Participation in Strategic Sourcing Act would protect the veteran's preference when it comes to awarding government contracts to veteran and service-disabled veteran-owned businesses. That protection would come from a common-sense fix to an obvious loophole in the Department of Veterans Affairs Rule of Two. Currently, the Rule of Two mandates that when the VA wants to buy something, it must first make a determination whether there is at least two other veteran or service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses that can do the work at a fair and reasonable price. If that determination is made, the VA then enters into that contract for those products with those businesses. Sometimes, however, when the VA purchases office, janitorial, and other products through the uh, General Services Administration, it does not always apply the rule of two. Thus, that's the loophole this bill addresses and fixes. Under H.R. 2781, the Secretary of the VA, who Neil and I actually met with this morning, uh, must work with the GSA to increase the number of service-disabled veteran and veteran-owned small businesses represented in the contracting process. By making it easier to contract with the VA, veteran and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses will greatly benefit from this bill. As veterans, Congressman Dunn and I understand the challenges that our service members face when transitioning from military to civilian life and running their own businesses. As Americans, we understand that we should be working to serve those who served us. That is why, as members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, we are introducing this bipartisan bill that gives our veterans more opportunity to thrive and to serve not only the government of our country, but our communities. And that is why both Neil and I encourage our colleagues to support this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Panetta, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, now we will hear from Representative Poliquin speaking in support of the fourth piece of legislation, a draft bill to improve the hiring, training, and efficiency of VA acquisition personnel and organizations. Mr. Poliquin, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I am very proud to sponsor this bill with you, Mr. Chairman, and also with Ranking Member Custer. You know, I'm new to this committee, but I'm already very familiar, and I think we all are, with some of the VA contracting uh, disasters that we've seen throughout the country, and they continue to happen. Uh, and nobody knows more about uh, construction management problems than Mr. Kaufman from Colorado. The new medical center in his district is more than $1 billion over budget, and it's still, Mr. Chairman, it's still not complete. The Inspector General's report explains how this happens. I encourage everybody to read it because everything possible that could go wrong did go wrong. Now, another example was right here in Washington, D.C. at the uh, VA Medical Center. Uh, the supply chain there, Mr. Chairman, completely broke down. There were employees at the Washington, D.C. Medical Center who were scrambling to borrow basic medical supplies from other hospitals and postponing procedures. One of the VA's reports about its own investigation quotes a, log a logistics employee describing the state of the organization. Uh, and I do paraphrase here, but it was something like this. The employee said, we don't have an actual operable inventory system. It's all manual or by hand. You have to remember, we have people down here who just are put on the spot and given a credit card and asked to go out and buy supplies. Now, that is completely unacceptable. Some of the VA's most important programs, like our choice program, Mr. Chairman, are run through contracts. The VA has attributed these problems to early and bad contracts and are now trying to improve the program through better contracts. But my point is, there always seems to be a problem with contracts. And so we got to you know, reach out and come up with a solution to fix this problem. Now, my bill, Mr. Chairman, tackles two of the big problems that the VA has when it comes to acquisition and a workforce that does not get the training it needs and the outrageously complicated bureaucracy that Mr. Bergman described. 
My bill directs the VA to set up, very simply, a career certification program for a logistics employee or for someone who's involved in construction and facilities management. The department gets to design the programs, but they have to include better training. The employee must complete courses to achieve these certifications, and they must achieve these certifications in order to advance professionally within the VA. Now, this is not a new idea. The Department of Defense already does this. And the VA already has a career certification program for contracting employees. So it's time to recognize that logistical workers and construction managers also are important and need this training and certification. Now, my bill also directs the VA to expand its acquisition intern programs. These are great programs to bring new college graduates and recent veterans into the VA and to train them to do these jobs, Mr. Chairman. We need these young people to replace the older employees that are retiring in greater numbers every year. Now, it takes a long time, Mr. Chairman, for all, everybody in these jobs to learn how these <laughs> contracting regulations work and how construction management and how supply chains operate. We need to plan for the future and grow our talent from within. So it's time to use these intern programs as, uh, as best we can to the maximum extent possible. Finally, Mr. Chairman, my bill pays for these workforce improvements, these training improvements, by consolidating redundant acquisition bureaucratic problems. Now, the bill sets out 10 possible areas, and the secretary of the VA gets to decide how to do it, but it's got to happen. I encourage everybody at the VA not to look at the consolidation as threatening. The situation we have today is a mess, and we've got to fix it. The Choice Act independent assessment found widespread concern among VA employees themselves about so many different contracting organizations doing the same things and failing to perform up to expectations. And the GAO found too many types of confusing policies from different places. Even the people who write the policies couldn't keep track of it all. So it's time to straighten this thing out, and if we do, everybody will benefit. The department needs good acquisition talent, the best it can get. This is not about downsizing. It's about getting everybody in the right places in the training they need and removing this blanket of bureaucracy that's stifling everybody. This bill, Mr. Chairman, is a strong first step towards correcting this acquisition reform or, or rather, going down the, the pathway of acquisition reform. And I encourage everybody on this committee, Republicans and Democrats, to support it. And finally, Mr. Chairman, for the record, I would like to submit this statement from Associated General Contractors of America in support of this bill. I yield back my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Poliquin. I now welcome the members of our panel who are seated at the witness table. First, uh, VA informed us yesterday afternoon of its intention to substitute its lead witness, so I wanted to note that in order to dispel any confusion about the name on VA's written testimony, not matching that of the individual testifying today for them today. With us today from VA, we have Mr. Tom Burgess, Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Logistics and Supply Chain Management. He is accompanied by Mr. Tom Lenny, the Executive Director for Small and Veteran Business Programs at VA. We have Mr. Pat Murray, Associate Director of the National Legislative Service at the Veterans of Foreign Wars. We also have Ms. Caitlin Gray, uh, Assistant Director of the National Veterans Employment and Education Division, Division at the American Legion. And welcome to your first testimony. Um, finally, we have Mr. Wayne Simpson, a member of the National Veteran Small Business Coalition representing the organization. Uh, Mr. Burgess, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Bergman, Ranking Member Custer, Custer and uh, members of the subcommittee. On behalf of Mr. Fry, who definitely intended to be at today's hearing, I express his regrets uh, at his absence uh, due to a family tragedy overseas yesterday. Um, on Mr. Fry's behalf, I appreciate the opportunity to address the subcommittee regarding the four bills that affect department acquisitions and veteran-owned small businesses. 
I am joined today by Mr. Tom Lenny, uh, Executive Director, Small and Business, uh, Veteran Business Programs in the Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. VA is a significant contributor to the government's efforts to ensure a fair proportion of contracting dollars are awarded to small businesses. According to federal procurement records, VA was the fourth largest federal agency in terms of FY16 contract spend. See you, buddy. Out of $23.1 billion in reported contract spend, VA awarded over 29% to small businesses. VA also reported more dollars awarded to service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses than all other federal civilian agencies combined. Ensuring the highest quality service to veterans, improving our acquisition processes, and complying with laws and regulations impacting veteran-owned small businesses are top priorities for the department. We'd like to comment on each of the four bills separately. Uh, respecting H.R. 2006, VA does not support the bill, which would require VA to calculate and record cost avoidance achieved through the procurement process. This process is not required by the Federal Acquisition Regulation, nor does it appear to be a requirement for any other federal agency. VA's procurement process is not unique and should not be treated as such by imposing this requirement on the agency. The bill also requires development of standardized procurement templates. The department's contract writing system does store required clauses and apply standardized logic in the creation of contract documents. Electronic copies of these contracts are stored in the system and can be reused or modified easily to meet a future need. Regarding H.R. 2749, this bill would clarify the performance expectations for service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses and veteran-owned small businesses receiving contracts under the Veterans First Contracting Program authorities. We recognize that awards to SD, VOSBs, and VOSBs can provide these entrepreneurs with the resources and opportunities they can use to develop their business according to their own business plans and objectives. This goal will be accomplished only if these firms perform a certain share of the work themselves and not simply pass the work through to others. This bill would give our regulatory action a statutory basis by referencing Section 46 of the Small Business Act, where the limitations on subcontracting rules are currently contained. Finally, it would strengthen enforcement through a certification by the awardee that it will comply with these requirements and provide a role for VA to monitor and enforce compliance. With respect to H.R. 2781, VA does not support this legislation. This bill would require the Secretary of Veterans Affairs to certify whether there are sufficient numbers of service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses and veteran-owned small businesses in each category of federal strategic sourcing initiative contracts managed by the Office of Federal Procurement uh, Policy and General Services Administration. VA does not believe that any additional legislation is required as proper application of the current law is sufficient to ensure that VA does not place orders against FSSI contracts if the rule of two is not satisfied. Finally, regarding the draft bill to improve hiring, training, and efficiency of acquisition personnel and organizations of the department, VA does not support the draft bill. Section 1A requires VA to develop and implement a training and certification program. It is not entirely clear, based on the language, if this program is for more than just acquisition personnel. Section 2 would require the Secretary to develop a plan that achieves cost savings from the reduction in duplication and increased efficiency to be used to support increased participation in the intern program as well as the training and certification programs. In an effort to, teach, to achieve potential savings, VA would be required to centralize procurement and logistics employees. VA has previously provided technical comments on this proposed legislation and does not feel it is necessary. VA is the only civilian agency with a dedicated training academy. VA established a contracting intern school and a Warriors to Workforce program to internally supplement traditional procurement workforce recruitment. VA would like to retain existing flexibility to modify throughput of these programs based on evolving workload requirements. VA currently follows OMB and OFPP acquisition program certification requirements and does not see the need for legislation in this area. Thank you for the opportunity to, to appear before you today. Mr. Lenny and I will be pleased to answer any questions you or other members may have. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Uh, Mr. Murray, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Bergman, Ranking Member Custer, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the men and women of the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States Citizens Auxiliary, thank you for the opportunity to present VFW's thoughts on these proposed bills. 
For years, Department of Veteran Affairs has not uniformly tracked cost savings in the competitive bidding process. Simple databases would allow VA to have consistent tracking systems that would keep track of savings and allow for enhancements across the entire contracting system. The savings provided for VA would ultimately mean a savings for the taxpayers and allow for money spent by VA to be better used to support veterans. The VFW supports the VA Procurement Efficiency and Transparency Act and does not agree with the VA's reason to oppose this. Everyone else not having to do it is not an acceptable excuse. This proposal would implement a database that keep track of the average bids, the winning bid and bids, and produce a cost savings analysis for future use. Additionally, the VFW thinks using standardizing procurement templates across the entire department would only streamline the procurement process and help VA become more efficient across the board. <clears throat> Pass-through contracts have been a problem in the veteran-owned small business community for far too long. Hardworking veterans who are trying to advance their businesses are plagued by others who are taking advantage of loopholes and under-scrutinized regulations. It's been far too easy for business owners operating in bad faith to pass off work as their own in order to make a quick buck off the system. The VFW supports protecting business opportunities for Veterans Act, which would help strengthen the regulations regarding VOSBs and keep those who abuse the system from continuing to do so. VOSBs provide an integral part of our country's business community. They provide veterans with the outlet to start up their businesses and take part in our nation's free market system. There are, however, some bad actors who take advantage of the veteran programs offered and try to abuse the system. This regulation would provide the veteran small business operating in good faith the opportunity to flourish by removing these so-called VOSBs that do not adhere to the rules and regulations. Remo removing these businesses that act as a pass-through for larger entities will clean out the field and give those veterans that are doing the right thing the ability to grow. Certain contracts in the VA are only attainable by certain larger corporations, and smaller veteran-owned businesses cannot compete at that level. For example, contracts such as office supplies and janitorial equipment are written in ways that allow large suppliers to attain the contracts but not smaller companies. Making the contracts more open would allow the competition possibly more cost savings to the VA. VFW feels that having certain contracts unattainable for VOSBs is unfair for competitive contracting and is something that needs to change. That's why the VFW supports ensuring veteran enterprise participation in strategic sourcing that would help improve the abilities of veteran small businesses to attain federal contracts. This would help raise the number of veterans working under federal contracts and help strengthen the entire small business community. Additionally, if the number of contracts awarded in certain categories is too low, having the secretary, giving the secretary permission to order stoppage of those contracts awarded that is too restrictive for veterans to participate in is a great thing. Regarding the draft legislation, government agencies have been using the internship programs to move veterans into their ranks for years, and they're highly successful programs. Thousands of veterans have joined the federal government's workforce through, through programs such as the Warriors to Workforce program and the Acquisition Internship program. However, VA has been adding veterans to their workforce at a slower rate than some of these other programs. In recent years, there have been roughly 20 to 30 participants in VA's AIP while other agencies are placing almost 100 candidates annually. Expanding the program to bring dozens of more veterans to VA is an excellent way to make that a better government agency. The VFW strongly supports expanding the AIP, and this bill would increase the number of participants more than doubling the current amount. The Warriors to Workforce program and the AIP provide great pathways for veterans to join VA in procurement or logistics supply chain management fields. More veterans within the ranks of VA will only make it a stronger agency as these programs provide an in-depth, on-the-job training that results in well-rounded VA employees. The VFW supports developing a plan to reduce duplication as to increase efficiencies within the logistics and supply chain management programs. This effort would reduce unnecessary expenses from matching programs running concurrently. This cost savings could be better spent on improving the existing programs instead of being wastefully spent on similar efforts. Consolidating or abolishing duplicate functions of the Procurement and Logistics Office of the VA will help eliminate wasteful spending and make the entire office more efficient. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. I'd be happy to answer any questions you or members of the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Mr. Murray. Uh, Ms. Gray, you are now recognized for five minutes. 
Thank you, Chairman Bergman, Ranking Member Custer, and members of the subcommittee. On behalf of Charles E. Schmidt, National Commander of the American Legion, and over two million members, we thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the American Legion's position on the pending legislation. The American Legion sees the legislation under review today as having the potential to improve the VA's acquisition systems and processes. Due to the allotted time available, I will only speak on three of the four bills listed. H.R. 2006, the VA Procurement Efficiency and Transparency Act, would require the VA to uniformly track cost savings in its contracting competitions and ensure the use of standardized contracting procedures. Currently, the VA measures savings using inconsistent local policies and disorganized templates, leading to inaccurate contracting data and inefficient and costly procurement results. Under this practice, the VA has misspent billions due to its negligence and disregard for procurement rules. During the 114th Congress, the subcommittee held hearings examining the VA's flawed procurement processes, identifying the waste of billions. The June 2016 hearing received testimony on the significance of consistently using a uniform template when procuring medical services for veterans from affiliated hospitals. Testimony further revealed that negotiating these contracts from scratch instead of using standardized contracts resulted in inexcusable wait times, some as long as three years to finalize. Consequently, these long wait times for contract finalization have caused significant delays for veterans in receiving their much needed health care. However, this bill falls short of giving stakeholders sufficient ability to clearly understand the alternative spending solutions and how they might produce greater utility for taxpayers' dollars. Specifically, this bill would only ensure visibility into the pricing and configurations of vendors who responded to a solicitation. Given that this would only represent a subset of the supplier community, the end result would be an incomplete data set employing a strategy that only looks at those opportunities that were evaluated. Notwithstanding the concerns noted above, we see a modified version of this bill producing value and utility for both the taxpayer and the nation's veterans. The American Legion supports H.R. 2006 with amendments. H.R. 2749, Protecting Business Opportunities for Veterans Act of 2017, improves the oversight of contracts awarded by the VA to veteran-owned and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses. When a VOSB or SDVOSB is awarded a contract under the Vets First program, they're required to perform a certain percentage of work. However, there is a long-standing problem of improper pass-throughs in that program where businesses profit from the contracts while performing little to no work while passing them off to other companies. This bill would require participants in the Vets First program to certify that they are performing the required percentage of work and directs the VA to refer suspected violators to the Office of the Inspector General. This is crucial, especially after the Kingdom War decision, because essentially every VA small business contract is now set aside for the SDVOSBs and VOSBs. The American Legion supports legislation that will provide assistance and equal opportunity for veterans to start or grow a small business, including establishing numerical goals for all veterans to compete in government procurement. Therefore, the American Legion supports H.R. 2749. H.R. 2781, ensuring veteran enterprise participation in Strategic Sourcing Act, directs the VA to certify the sufficient participation of veteran-owned and service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses and contracts under the Federal Strategic Sourcing Initiative. This draft bill closes a loophole in 38 U.S.C. 8127 procurement requirements and requires VA to set aside the proper amount of contracts for veteran businesses. Currently, the VA obtains much of its supplies through government-wide strategic sourcing contracts run by the GSA. In some, some product categories, veteran-owned businesses hold few or no contracts. VA is required to work with GSA to increase veteran business representation on the contracts, and veterans must be given all available opportunities to pursue that 3% standard allotted to SDVOSBs. We view this draft bill as having the potential of producing substantial benefits for the veteran business community. However, the American Legion encourages Congress to implement a measurement that is stronger than just sufficient. We request that the term sufficient be changed to maximum extent practicable. The American Legion supports this bill with amendments. This concludes my testimony. The American Legion appreciates the opportunity to comment on the bills being considered, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gray, and as I mentioned earlier, this is your first testimony. Little did we know you were going to get a concert in the background there. The, uh, the Nashville Songwriters Association is meeting with uh, Chairman Rowe in his office, so uh, 
these rooms are not exactly soundproof. So uh, appreciate your your persevering through the background, un unintentional background uh, accompaniment. Uh, Mr. Simpson, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Custer, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for all you do for America's veterans and their families and providing the National Veterans Small Business Coalition with this opportunity to share its views on legislation to strengthen Department of Veterans Affairs acquisitions. The National Veterans Small Business Coalition is the largest not-for-profit organization of its kind representing America's veteran-owned small businesses to the federal government, giving them a collective voice on legislative, regulatory, and policy issues affecting federal procurement. We do so to enhance procurement opportunities for veteran small business entrepreneurs engaged in or seeking to enter the federal marketplace. Today, I would like to start my testimony discussing the draft bill concerning improving hiring and training of VA acquisition personnel and improving the efficiency of acquisition organizations at VA. From our perspective, this is perhaps the most important bill before us here today. The National Veteran Small Business Coalition fully supports any legislation which strengthens VA acquisition operations and improves the knowledge and skills of the department's acquisition professionals. Procurement reform through legislation at VA is long overdue. Although VA has a robust training program worthy of emulation offered through the VA Acquisition Academy in Frederick, Maryland, we believe VA's training program could always be strengthened with curricula specifically designed to train VA acquisition and small business personnel in the area of socioeconomic procurement preference program goal development, attainment, advocacy, and the use of the Veterans First contracting program. VA's acquisition organization structure, on the other hand, leaves much to be desired. VA's continued decentralized approach to its acquisition operations creates duplication of efforts, redundant procurements, waste, and inefficiency. Multiple VA contracting activities, all seeking to prove themselves as value-added organizations, seek to conduct procurements as if to compete with other contracting activities as to which organization can do the best job. This is troubling to VA's industry partners and has an adverse effect on SDVOSBs and VOSBs. It is truly dumbfounding as to why VA allows this organizational structure to persist. Veterans and American taxpayers certainly deserve better, and this can be accomplished through centralizing and strengthening acquisition leadership and programs at the department level. As examples, we offer the following. VA's Strategic Acquisition Center in Fredericksburg, Virginia is now conducting most of VA's medical surgical related procurements. These procurements having been migrated there from the National Acquisition Center's National Contract Service in Hines, Illinois. The SAC often uses open market procurement methods to conduct its acquisitions. The SAC charges the Veterans Health Administration a 3% service level agreement fee for this privilege, as opposed to when VHA buys using VA federal supply schedule contracts, which includes only a one half of 1% industrial funding fee. In other words, VHA's cost on many acquisitions increase from one and one half percent to 3% of every procurement dollar spent, a 600% increase. While a two and one half cent fee increase per dollar does not sound like it's significant, multiply this against the billions of dollars VA spends each year on medical, surgical, and related items. Although buying through the Strategic Acquisition Center now helps replenish VA supply fund, it dramatically increases VHA's cost to use these contract vehicles. These fees are paid by VHA from the same funding used for the procurement, most often the medical care appropriation. Increasing the cost to buy has to come at an opportunity cost to VA. What is that opportunity cost? There are those in VA which suggest these cost savings resulting from procurements conducted by the SAC offset the increased fees to use these contract vehicles, but no empirical data is available to prove this assertion. Additionally, many within and outside of the VA's procurement community are left wondering what the mission of the VA National Acquisition Center's National Contract Service is now that most of its work has migrated to the SAC without a commensurate adjusting and staffing. Furthermore, open market purchases undermine VA's federal supply schedule program and the revenue stream generated by the industrial funding fee to its supply fund, which funds a large part of VA's acquisition operations and all of VA's Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization to include VA's Center for Verification Evaluation. This is only but one of a couple of examples of, uh, of the nature of VA's decentralized and competing acquisition program 
where one contracting element does not appear to communicate with another. VA must be held to account for its acquisition operations and demanded to improve. With regards to VA's organizational procurement structures and efficiencies, VHA has established three service area offices, also known as SAOs, all of which appear to be competing within the greater VA procurement community to show the value they too add. It is our sincere hope the draft bill will begin to address the long overdue overhaul necessary of VA's procurement structure and operations to improve efficiency and accountability to the American taxpayers while improving opportunities for service disabled veteran owned small businesses and veteran owned small businesses. It would seem only legislation will resolve this decades old problem. Lastly, as for the confuse, confusing, confusing as VA's decentralized and dysfunctional procurement system is, is to even VA personnel, in many cases, imagine the significant confusion this causes for SDVOSBs and VOSBs in the greater veteran business community at large. While the SAC appears to be moving away from the FSS program, VA National Acquisition Center continues to award FSS contracts. Throw the three SAOs into the mix and SDVOSBs and VOSBs realize the duplicate and competing organizational efforts make contracting with VA confusing and administratively cumbersome. Additionally, how does SDVOSBs or VOSBs determine which contracting opportunities to pursue, which will result in the best return on their investment? Fortunately, for-profit SDVOSBs and VOSBs would never operate their prospective procurement operations the way the VA does. Congress must resolve this dysfunction, waste, and inefficiency. VA continues to demonstrate it is incapable of doing so. H.R. 2781 addresses participation by SDVOSBs and VOSBs in contracts under the Federal Strategic Sourcing Initiative. Our concern is how VA will implement this legislation. VA demonstrated in implementing its Veterans First Contracting Program under Public Law 109461, the Veterans Benefits, Healthcare, and Information Technology Act of 2006, its conservative and contradictory stand on legislation benefiting veteran small businesses. It took a Supreme Court decision to resolve this issue. In the case of H.R. 2871, we believe that Congress should explicitly state in its intent that this and any other legislation addressing VA's procurements in the contact of veteran small businesses whereby nothing in the legislation should be construed as relieving VA, VA's obligation of applying the rule of two. Not to do so, we believe, will likely result in another misguided VA implementation which, which provides VA with a loophole of reporting of, of um, uh, using the rule of two. The coalition fully supports H.R. 2006, the VA Procurement Efficiency and Transparency Act, which we believe will add greatly, great utility in VA capturing and understanding its cost savings. Additionally, the use of standardized templates in the conduct of procurements VA-wide should improve the quality of VA solicitations and the contracts is awarded resulting from those solicitations. It is clear from the quality of some of the solicitations currently being issued, supervisory personnel are not monitoring or reviewing the quality of those solicitations. The National Veteran Small Business Coalition supports 20, H.R. 2749, the Protecting Business Opportunities for Veterans Act of 2017. This legislation is consistent with U.S. Small Business Administration's amended regulations allowing for subcontracting opportunities with similarly situated small business concerns without said, without said subcontracting, counting against the prime contractor's limitations on subcontracting. Similarly situated small business concerns are those with the same socioeconomic procurement preference program status. We believe H.R. 2749 would be strengthened by indicating the context of VA procurements conducted pursuant to the Veterans First Contracting Program that a similarly situated SDVOSB or VASB must have been verified by VA's Center for Verification and Evaluation and listed in VA's vendor information pages database. This important distinction will ensure verified SDVOSBs and, v and VOSBs do not subcontract to non-verified SDVOSBs and VOSBs, all those these businesses are similarly situated. situated. In closing, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Custer, we would like to call your attention the VA has flatlined its service disabled better known small business and better known small business goals since fiscal year 2010, despite substantially exceeding these goals each year. We have provided a chart to the subcommittee which tracks VA's goals and accomplishments for the last 11 fiscal years. You can appreciate how disturbing this chart is to veterans and the coalition. Clearly, for all intent and purposes, such low goals are truly meaningless and call into question the strength and the effectiveness, if not the legitimacy, of VA's advocacy on behalf of veteran small businesses. VA's fiscal year 2014 goals were not communicated to VA personnel until there was only 38 days remaining in the fiscal year. A recent Freedom of Information Act request revealed VA's secretary did not issue any goaling memoranda for fiscal years 2015 and 2016, and the fiscal year 2017 goals were only issued on May 25th of this year, with 128 days remaining in fiscal year 27. 
We ask and hope you will use your considerable influence to encourage the subcommittee on economic opportunity to hold a hearing for VA to explain and account for its goals and advocacy of the subcommittee to the subcommittee and America's veterans. This completes my statement and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Uh, the written statements of those who have just provided oral testimony will be entered into the hearing record. We will now proceed with questioning and I'll uh, reserve my time till the end. Uh, ranking member Custer is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just address my questions to the panel, but I think Mr. Burgess uh, perhaps is would be the best to answer. Um, have you become aware of any small business exploiting the non-manufacturer rule and class waiver system to become pass-throughs and sidelining veteran-owned small businesses that are acting in good faith? No, ma'am, I'm not personally aware. Would you take that back to oh, the VA for, for a response on that? Thank you. And um, do you have any concerns regarding the Secretary's role in recommending penalties, such as levying of fines or criminal prosecution, when the Secretary has found that a veteran-owned small business has violated the legislation? No, ma'am. That's, that's, uh, we support that. Okay. And if a veteran-owned small business subcontracts out 50% or more of the product, goods, or services, does that have any effect on the timing and e efficiency of the procurement? I don't believe it does, ma'am. Okay. I don't believe it does. And are you aware if any veteran-owned small businesses that manufacture high-tech medical equipment, and what's the average percentage of work that these veteran-owned small businesses subcontract out? Do you have any information on that, on uh, high-tech medical equipment? No, ma'am. I'm not aware of any small business high-tech medical uh, equipment manufacturers. I'm not personally aware of any. Okay. Market research hasn't indicated any. Okay, thank you. Um, to the VSOs, what impact do bad faith actors such as pass-through contractors have on the ability of veteran-owned small businesses to successfully bid for federal contracts? Uh, Ma'am, it, it clogs up the system. It takes uh, the opportunities away from those that are operating in good faith, trying to expand their businesses that are being kind of pushed out, uh, that can offer lower prices to attain those contracts only to pass them off to a larger contractor. Um, it keeps the people trying to do the right thing from being able to do so. And thank you. And do you have any concerns regarding the Secretary's role in recommending penalties such as levying fines or criminal prosecution when they find a violation? No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to the other bill, H.R. 2781, uh, the Veteran Enterprise Participation. Um, again, to Mr. Burgess, would requiring the Secretary of VA to monitor, certify, and consult with GSA regarding the participation of veterans-owned small businesses in the Federal Strategic Sourcing Act further promote these veteran-owned small businesses? Uh, yes, ma'am. We just don't believe that the, a, a certification process after the fact, after GSA has awarded those contracts, is, uh, is going to... Uh, uh, actually fix accountability uh, to make the process work the way it uh, should work. What, what, what would you recommend? We have concerns. What we do, what we do routinely, ma'am, is we are in constant uh, coordination and collaboration with GSA as they are developing these solutions. We put our requirements, as all other departments uh, do, into the mix. Uh, obviously, one of our special requirements is a need to have SDVOSBs and VOSBs available on those uh, contract solutions if we're going to use them. Uh, for whatever reason, sometimes uh, uh, the solutions don't allow uh, a GSA to, to put those types of firms in different contract uh, arrangements. And when they do not, for reasons that GSA determines, we simply do not use that portion of an FSSI. We defer to 8127. If, so, we, if, we are, if we are purchasing improperly, then you should hold us accountable for that. And do you have some way of reporting that back to us? We're, we're just looking, we have an oversight role. We're an oversight and investigation what, subcommittee what, of VA. What, how are we going to know? You said it, there are sometimes there are some reasons why it might not what happen. V, what VA how do we would, know? What VA would suggest is that we affix accountability uh, on the category managers who actually develop 
and execute the solutions, okay? They, they receive our requirements, okay? And they should, they should be the certifying party that says, we have put in place a solution that permits all agencies, including VA, to use our solution, which is, which is the federal intent to maximize the spend and leverage the spend. And uh, just for us to my certify time after is the fact. Up, but I'm just curious about how we would find out why it didn't happen. Um, I think that's a question uh, we would have to get with GSA on. Okay, thank you. I'll leave back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Poliquin, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. I appreciate it. Mr. Burgess, um, I appreciate your, your comments on my draft bill, which is entitled The Hiring, Training, and Efficiency of VA Acquisition Personnel and Organizations. And I know in your written testimony that it reflects an earlier version of the bill. Um, we have uh, worked with your staff and made sure that there is an updated version of the bill that you have seen. And so my question to you is, uh, in the earlier version, um, logistics personnel were uh, being prohibited uh, to be supervised by the people for whom they're purchasing things, but that language has been removed. Does that satisfy your concern? The, the draft bill includes many, many subject areas. So, um, in general, uh, we we need uh, we need flexibility to assign people sure uh, in the best way possible to uh, achieve the mission outcomes that we desire. Yo, um, you know, specifically on this issue, sir, when it comes to um, making sure that logistic employees are being supervised by the people for whom they're purchasing things. Is that okay with you? Logistics people. It, it, it is absolutely fine that logistics personnel great, can thanks. work for it. All right, great, thanks. Let's move on. Thank you. Um, do you think, Mr. Burgess, that the, um, the acquisition interim program is a good program? It's an excellent program. Great. In government. Um, do you agree that the quality of contracting officers and logistics staff and facility managers are in high demand in government? Uh, contracting personnel are very much in demand. Logistics personnel uh, less Good. in demand. Do you, do you believe that a lot of these folks are expected to retire the next five years? Uh, there is a sizable portion of the uh, uh, logistics population that can retire. Okay. Therefore, do you agree that the interim program at the VA, when we train young talent, many of them are veterans, is a good idea? to fill these vacancies? Yes, sir. Great. All right, so far, so good. Um, why don't you think anybody at the VA would fully support expanding this internship program? We have, over the years, expanded the internship program uh, to the degree that we have deemed appropriate, given the workload. OK, well, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. How many interns do you think are graduating this year? This year, I think we are only graduating 30, maybe. Okay, about 30. How many vacancies are there in these associated jobs at the VA right now, roughly? Acquisition jobs. Uh, contracting jobs are approximately 2,500. Let me make sure I understand this. Is that you're graduating about 30 interns, and you have about 2,500 jobs open in this general area. This year we're graduating 30. That was a, a reduction in what, of our, what our trend has been. Okay, so it seems like you need more bodies, right? Uh, we always are searching for quality contracting officers. Okay. We have our intern, our, the interns we've graduated today account for about 10% of our contracting work. Okay, so I'm, I'm guessing that you and I agree that it's a good idea to, exp good idea to expand this internship program. It's a good idea to expand it. Or the objection we have is the, uh, the fixed parameters uh, between two to four times. We, we don't think that's... Yeah, but you just required. said that you're graduating 20 or 30 interns and you have hundreds of vacancies in the same area. Is that right? Our, our turnover in the 1102 is approximately 150 to 250 a year. Okay, so why in the heck wouldn't, would you want to expand it to the uh, extent that we've uh, 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 recommended? We, again, the, the language specifies uh, not less than tw two times and not more than four times. 
We just think those, those parameters are arbitrary, and we would like to have the flexibility to determine what that number is, commensurate with all the other department uh, competing requirements, including funding for such programs. Okay. Let's move on a little bit. Mr. Simpson, uh, I know you're here somewhere. Yes, sir. Mr. Simpson, over here. Thank you. Um, the other thing my bill does is it deals with uh, career certification programs to improve training for logistic employees and construction managers. Uh, you worked at the department uh, at the uh, at the v at the um, uh, at the VA for 35 years. Almost 38, yes, sir. Okay, correct. Thank you very much for your service. And the Department of Defense has done what we're already talking about years ago. Um, do you think that this is something the VA needs to do? In terms of expanding their internship program? Yeah, not only that, but also making sure there's certification uh, programs for logistic employees and construction management employees. I don't think it would hurt. Okay. Uh, I think the example of how construction management handled the facility in Aurora, Colorado, perhaps if those professionals had been trained a little bit better, that might have uh, prevented that from happening. And maybe saved a billion dollars for the taxpayers, right? Possibly. That's not a bad idea. Okay. Mr. Murray, what do you think? Uh, having <clears throat> some personal experience with what's going on in uh, Aurora, I, I think that, as Mr. Simpson said, this can absolutely help. Uh, that situation is a perfect example of ways to improve in a lot of ways. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back my time. Thank you, Mr. Pollack. When, um, Dr. Dunn, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, General. Um, uh, he runs a tight ship, so let's keep our answers short. Ms. Gray, I understand the American Legion supports my bill, that's H.R. 2781, but wants to amend it to go even farther beyond getting a sufficient number of uh, service disabled and veteran owned small businesses uh, on the GSA contracts. The Legion would like to see the maximum practical on the contracts. How might we do that and what is the maximum number in your mind? Sir, thank you for the question. I will have to um, get back with you on that, um, on the answer for that. That's fine. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Simpson, clear from your testimony that you have m some major concerns. Uh, with this process, uh, can you briefly, do you want to add to, any, to your concerns? Uh, no, sir, just the fact of the redundancy uh, in terms of the organizational structure is very, very confusing for people who want to do business at VA. Thank you. How about you, Mr. Murray? Uh, concerns on this? Uh, just that we, we'd like to see it expanded as much as possible to include as many uh, VOSBs as we can make happen. Let me say I'm grateful to the VSOs for being here and, and representing the veterans. I, I'm grateful. Mr. Burgess, help me understand the VA's position. Your testimony indicated that the VA already has to give veterans, veteran business preferences uh, if there aren't enough of them on the FSI uh, uh, and if there aren't enough of them on the FSSI contracts. They have to go elsewhere. Uh, do, do we agree that the FSSI contracts are good contracts, easy to use? FSSI is a good federal-wide program. Good, good. So <clears throat> wouldn't the best solution be to make sure that we have enough veteran businesses on those so that you can satisfy your veteran contracting requirements and continue to use those? That would be, that would be a good solution. Okay, great. The, uh, the uh, secretary apparently issued a memo on May 25th exempting certain VA contracts from small business participation. I understand large dollar major construction contracts. Uh, uh, another one was for delivery services, specifically mentioned UPS and uh, FedEx. Can you assure me that there are no other FSI, FSSI contracts that are included in the exemption that was granted on May 25th? I'll have to get back and check on that, sir. We'd like to have, no, I mean, we want to be clear. We don't want to sort of paint with a broad brush. We would like to know if there are exceptions. We need to uh, know that for our for our veterans, if we could please. So um, how can, Mr. Burgess again, how can we work this out so that the VA can continue to use the major contractors that they want, but in the small business area, we really are including the veteran-owned businesses? We, we certainly will continue our collaboration with GSA and the various category and subcategory managers uh, that are putting these solutions in place. We work, we work regularly with them. And uh, we, do not, we do not award or administer those contracts, and we are not necessarily part of the evaluation process that awards those contracts. But we will continue to make our desires known that 
an adequate representation. So you just got to a good point. You don't really part of that process. Let's go into that. Do I understand that the VA holds a position that's, uh, that it cannot work with the GSA to increase the number of veteran businesses in the contract? We, we can certainly work with GSA to do that. Okay, so that's that's a misunderstanding. You're, you're willing to work with the Absolutely. VA? Absolutely. We in work order with them to all the time. Grow the number, the universe of veteran owned businesses that, that is our participate. Aim. Yes. All right. Um, uh, finally, uh, in our last minute here, can you convince us on the panel and the VSOs who are present with you uh, that the VA would solve this problem without being directed to by legislation? VA is not in a position to unilaterally solve the problem. We need the cooperation of the category managers and, and frankly, some of the solutions that are in place today where we don't have access to SDVOSVs and VOSBs is simply a reflection that the SDVOSBs or VOSBs do not have the capabilities uh, in the areas that uh, GSA has solicited for. Some of those are geographic restrictions. Some of the solutions like uh, the uh, uh, building maintenance operations, they have multiple categories ranging from elevator maintenance, HVAC repairs, and when they solicit, uh, they make awards against these categories, and sometimes the VOSBs and SDVOSBs have either not participated or for some, some reason or another have not been awarded. We're in our last 10 seconds, so let, let me just, I guess, close before we yield by saying that I would really like to, I mean, um, these, it sounds like we are, we're gumming up the works with all these, all these requirements, and, and you have a bunch of good veteran-owned businesses, good businessmen who want to provide good service at a, at a reasonable price. And, and I, would, I would ask you to reach out and do everything we possibly could to, to work with them. Thank you, Mr. General, I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Dunn. Um, I guess I'm last. It's been a, certainly an interesting morning of unique sounds through the system. So we'll try to get through this here without uh, any, other, um, any other issues with that. Uh, Mr. Burgess. I would like to start with your testimony about H.R. 2749. You noted the VA has some concerns that it would like to address, though it apparently does not oppose the bill. Would you like to elaborate now? You want to take that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is not a case of uh, that, we don't, that we don't support the bill. We share the chair's commitment to ensuring that uh, we eliminate pass-throughs uh, from VOSBs who are not doing the work. Our concern about this bill is you would be locking into place a situation, particularly on our supply contracts, where VOSBs who are pass-throughs are not required to do any work at all on, the, on a uh, procurement and could pass the entire amount of the procurement through. And we don't believe that that's your intent. Okay. So, the, uh, uh, Mr. Simpson, would you like to uh, comment on that? I think that uh, one of the things, as long as the VA, what they do is consistent with what the SBA regulations are. As a matter of fact, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2017 tied the Secretary of Veterans Affairs' hands a little bit about how they uh, administer the veterans program over there in terms of procurements, using the same definitions and things. So. Since they're starting to go in the direction of the way SBA is doing things, I don't think that they should have a definite inconsistency with what the SBA regulations are. If you look at what SBA allows for contracting with similarly situated firms, our concern is that an SDVOSB or VSB would subcontract out to a non-verified VA firm under a VA set aside. Okay. Um, Mr. Burgess or Mr. Lenny, if this bill is enacted, how will VA use company certifications that they are not improperly passing through the work to do a better job of, in, of enforcing the pass-through rules? Uh, we, would, we would apply the certification provided by the offerer, and we have mechanisms to, we have a uh, subcontracting review program where, whereby we go out and look at uh, the actual performance of prime contractors to make sure they are complying with limitations on subcontracting. Okay. So we would have the ability to enforce it. However, I would say again, on uh, many of our contracts, there would, be, there would be no requirement for the prime contractor to do any work on the contract. 
Okay. Uh, Ms. Gray, any thoughts on that? As far as this bill goes, sir, um, it, anything that bolsters service day veteran-owned small business or veteran business in general, the American Legion supports. Um, I've heard anecdotal evidence of veterans having problems with the pass-through, and if there's anything that can be done to minimize the pass-throughs, but also keep keep regulations simple for veterans who are really trying to just get into the contracting world, I think that's all I can ask for. That's all the American Legion can ask for. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Murray, any comments? Sir, uh, thank you. Having some personal knowledge of this, I think that it's, it's things that can always be fixed, always made better, and I think this legislation will only continue to do that. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Burgess, I was reviewing the VA's small business contracting scorecard for FY 2016. It actually got worse from 2015. The grade is still a B, but the overall score is down. <coughs> Excuse me. Compared to 2014, the scores are significantly worse in every category. And this is in spite of the Kingdomware Supreme Court decision being issued in 2016, toward the end of the fiscal year when VA you know, was awarding many of its contracts. Excuse me, I got a little <coughs> tickle in my throat here. Why is VA's small business performance lagging? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll I'll answer that for you if you would mind. Mainly it's due to changes in our mix of products and services. For example, uh, in 2016, our use of the uh, patient-centered community care program went from about uh, $1.6 billion to $2.4 billion. We've had huge increases in programs that do, have not lent themselves to the use of small businesses. But overall, I'd, I'd like to add, I think uh, the number of uh, actions has actually risen, although the uh, absolute dollar value has not. Thank you. I see my time is about to expire here, and uh, our colleague uh, and fellow committee member, uh, Mr. Arrington, uh, arrived right on time. You know, uh, you are recognized better late for five than ever. minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, panelists, and I apologize for being um, Late, I would have liked to have heard the testimony, but uh, I had one question for Mr. Burgess um, about uh, HR 2006. That's Mr. Kaufman's bill. VA um, seems to me doesn't think it's important to calculate the amount of money it saves by competing contracts and recording that information. Um, Certainly, it's possible to pay more for better quality. I don't think anybody's going to penalize you for doing that. So. Um, I'd like to see how much money the VA is saving through competition. Why wouldn't we want sir, that? Sure, we report? just don't believe that the that the approach to calculating the savings provides any any data that is is useful in the procurement process. It does provide a data point, but the the prices are compared during the evaluation process. Uh, if we're going to look at savings, okay, uh, G, GAO and OMB have consistently provided guidance that says we should try to calculate savings or cost avoidance against specific benchmarks so that we can uh, have a little bit more confidence that they're actual cost avoidance or savings rather than just uh, represented by an instant competitive action. That's all. Uh, something like what is the lowest commercial price known and, and what do we award against? That might be a more meaningful uh, number than just uh, the difference of the awarded amount and an average or median of all the uh, offers submitted. So do you do that now where you provide benchmarks so that you can have some reference for? We do not do it across the board, sir, uh, just because we haven't uh, seen the value in that. There are specific categories of procurements that we look at and we report uh, uh, to OMB on. Do you think it would be a good idea to do it across the board? You said you didn't see any value in that. You didn't uh, see no, sir. no, sir, I don't because each contracting action stands on its own. Um, uh, 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 offers are requested, bids or proposals are submitted, uh, an, evalu an evaluation process takes place, and it, it may be a, a low price award, it may be a best value award. Uh, the resulting number is just, as I indicated, a data point. It's not a useful reference point uh, in terms of the procurement process. It may be useful for, for uh, uh, future program managers to try to determine what their budgets might want to be. But from a contracting perspective, it, it doesn't any, add any value to our process. 
Okay. There's a, this is a fundamental no. problem that uh, uh, everybody assumes that, that, that the contract uh, is everything. Some of the problems are that, that uh, programs don't have a, as good of a uh, grasp on programs across government as they should be. And, and that gets reflected in a contract. But it, again, these data points are, are, don't add value to the procurement process. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to the witnesses for your thoughtful input today. The panel is now excused. The testimony provided today is an important contribution as this subcommittee moves forward with the legislation. I appreciate the witnesses' expertise. It is valuable to help us refine and improve the bill texts. We can all agree that acquisition must work properly in the VA. I appreciate the bipartisan cooperation of all the sponsors and co-sponsors of these pieces of legislation to pursue that end. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. Without objection, so ordered. I would like to once again thank all of you, the witnesses, the fellow committee members, and the audience members for joining us here this morning. This hearing is now adjourned.